In his book Light Force, Brother Andrew writes the following statement. The Lord ordered us to go and make disciples throughout the nations. Does this command apply to Arabs and Muslims? How can we look down on 1,000 million human beings who are loved by God? Many Muslims are indeed hostile to the Gospel, but many others are not. Never has such a dramatic change of that size uh, happened in world history. Dans toute l'histoire du monde, il ne s'est jamais passé quelque chose, une transformation, une mutation aussi dramatique que celle-là. Communism as an ideology collapsed. Le communisme en tant qu'idéologie s'est effondré. But not just without a cause. Mais il ne s'est pas effondré sans cause. But something else was happening in exactly that same decade. Mais voyez-vous, pendant cette même décennie, il y avait quelque chose d'autre qui était en train de se passer. With the collapse of communism as an ideology, the West had a total collapse of spirituality. En même temps que l'effondrement du communisme en tant qu'idéologie, l'Occident a connu un effondrement totalement de sa spiritualité. We felt no longer threatened and we abandoned God. On ne s'est plus senti menacé et dès lors on a abandonné Dieu. Something else dramatic happened. Il s'est passé aussi quelque chose d'autre de dramatique. In that very decade, there was a resurgence of Muslim fundamentalism. Pendant cette même décennie, il y a eu une résurgence de fondamentalisme musulman. And they suddenly began to address the whole world by saying, "Islam is the answer." Et tout à coup, ils se sont mis à adresser le monde entier en disant, la réponse c'est l'islam. Brother Andrew is a Dutch evangelical preacher married with five children. He has been working unceasingly with the Open Doors mission that he founded in 1955 for persecuted Christians living in hostile environments. Brother Andrew gave us an account of his calling and how he does his work in a Muslim world. I come from a small village St. Pancras, in the dark area of North Holland. My mother already had a heart for the lost, for beggars, um, homeless people, uh, people wandering the streets, and she would take them in and give them something to eat and drink, which we as children, we were a very poor family, uh, were not happy with because we thought, ah, oh, that's what I get less what my mother gives them. Uh, that's a, another principle. You never get less forgiving to others. You get more. But we had to learn it as children. So I grew up in that atmosphere. I was only 20 years old in 1948 when I found myself lying on a hospital bed during the war in Indonesia. My ankle had been smashed by a bullet. I was suffering and I had no one to call out to during the long days and it was even worse at night. That's when I turned to a little book given to me by my mother before I had left home. It was a Bible, a gift that I hadn't really appreciated at the time. But with nothing else to do in hospital, I began to read it, and after a few weeks, I reached the Gospels. Jesus was different to any other man that has ever existed. I asked myself if this incredible story could be true. Jesus was offering to forgive me of all my sins. I finally got back home to Holland and one night during a big storm in the winter of 1950 I said this simple prayer to God Lord Jesus if you will show me the way I will follow 
I knew that I would never be able to walk properly again, but for the first time in my life, I was at peace. I know the moment when I said yes to the call. But I had every reason not to accept the call. I was a semi-invalid. I had been badly wounded in the war. Um, I was uneducated, never been to school, had no diplomas. And, uh, but God kept saying, but, but you should be a missionary. And I remember one day, near my village, walking on the dike, I, I said, yes. And you know, the next day, the very next day, something happened to my old wounds. They broke open and stuff came out. And, and, and I was healed. So I could not say God to God anymore, well, I'm, I can't even walk properly. Uh, because now I could walk. And I proved it the next day by walking uh, seven kilometers to the youth cl club. And they thought I was crazy. I never walked because I couldn't. I walked. And that has been my, my story all over. And when God meets you, God keeps calling. God has other work for you. The secret of spiritual success is that you always say, yes, Lord. So then I went to a missionary training college and that was called the Worldwide, blah, blah, blah. But the Worldwide, but they only talked about half of the world. Never a word about communism. And that was half the world at that time in the 50s, 60s. And then God began to speak slowly to me through circumstances. As his studies to become a missionary came to an end, he responded to an invitation to go to a communist youth festival that he'd seen in a magazine. And that's how Brother Andrew ended up in Warsaw, Poland in July 1955, behind the Iron Curtain. Seeing at first hand how the church was persecuted by communism deeply moved him. And during this festival, while I was sitting on a bench in a large avenue of Warsaw and praying, I saw these young men and women parading past me, impeccably turned out, singing and shouting. They were acting in this way because they believed. They were proclaiming their good news. And a part of this good news was that mankind was in charge of his own destiny. God did not exist. And God spoke to me directly from his word. I just had that little book pressed to my, my heart. And, and God spoke, strengthen what remains that is at the point of death. And then I saw huge parades. Where communism is always impressive because it's massive. They overpower with sheer numbers and, 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 and volume and sound and... And, and, and then, then, then I had another word. Every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Then I looked and I thought, your knees too will one day bow before my Jesus. Your voice now that speaks about the glories of communism, one day that same mouth will have to confess Jesus Christ is Lord, because that's in my book. And that took all my fear away. And then I really began to see them as people that needed Jesus. I have him, so bring the two together. It's so simple. So as he would later write, Brother Andrew became God's smuggler. For over 12 years, he would cross into the most hostile communist bloc countries in his Volkswagen full of Bibles, unnoticed by the border guards, to seek out his brothers, give them his support, and bring the word of God to these countries where it was banned. I 
I found a wide open door. People are so willing. And I was so surprised. Why are we not aware of the situation in the world today where there are people that need Jesus and they want Jesus? We had uh, the first human rights conference uh, in the south of the country. And uh, we, uh, I was having one evening, we had dinner. I sat next to uh, President Gorbachev's chief advisor in the Soviet Union one of the ten mightiest men in the Soviet Union. It was before, long before the curtain came down. And of course I was speaking about Jesus and he said to me, Andrew, if only we could go back to the simplicity of the faith as we have heard it from Moses and Jesus. I thought, wow, this is what they talk about in the Kremlin. Not how they can cause more revolution or persecution, closed churches, burned Bibles deport young people, but is there something in religion that will change my life and that of my children and grandchildren, my future, my country? And that came from the top in the Kremlin. I was so surprised that the next morning in that conference I made a speech and I offered them one million Bibles to the Russian church. Of course, even in the church, the Bible was an unknown book at that time. There were many priests who had never read the Bible, didn't even have a Bible. Through the course of the years, Brother Andrew founded the Open Doors Mission, smuggling millions of Bibles into Eastern Europe, then China, Cuba, North Korea and Vietnam. In 1967, 25,000 New Testaments were secretly brought into China with covers identical to those of the Little Red Book. At the time, I thought that the rest of my life would be devoted to the countries of the Communist Revolution. But the doors closed in 1968 with the success of my book, God's Smuggler. I was no longer allowed to enter the Eastern Bloc. So when that book came out in 68, I almost went straight to the Muslim world. So I've been there now many, many years already, uh, almost 40 years in, in, the, in the Muslim world. And you know, I see the same situation there. People want a faith that can change them. So the whole adventure to the Muslims now, to the world of Islam, to me is very exciting because I see it in uh, a continuation of my ministry to the communists. I see no difference really. I see people. What interests us very much is your vision of the Islamic world today and also your vision of the Islamic faith. Is there the same God in the Christian and in the Islamic world? What would you say about this? Uh, if I have to make a comparison between Islam and um, Christianity, I say there is no point of comparison, really. Uh, the only thing that is the same as with communism. If you don't love people, you cannot get through to them. If that is our chief motive, I want to make Jesus known and bring his word, then I find the same openness with the Muslims as I basically found with the communists, because they know deep in their heart is there something in faith that can change me, that can give me security, that can give me real love. And they don't find it in their religion. They find other strong points in the religion, but not love from a father who loves them. And the interesting thing, I have not made very deep studies of Islam, although I do it 40 years now, 
But of the 99 beautiful names of Allah, Father is not one of them. Now the interesting thing, talk about Muslims, they love Jesus. Because in, in their book, the Quran, Jesus is the great physician. He heals the sick, they all know that. So of course they love Jesus. They don't love the Christian teaching about Jesus. But that is probably also because we have not presented that compassionate Jesus to them when they had a need. We have made war with them, we had our crusades, we killed them. We have now millions of Muslim immigrants and we don't accept them, we, don't, we expect them to integrate, but, but, but we don't even accept them. Uh, we're not showing the compassion of Jesus to these people. And how can we ever make a bridge there? That, that's my main point. We must go to them. As I went to the communists, I must go to the Muslims. And I find amazing things, so open. <laughs> Brother Andrew then spent a period of 15 years visiting those in charge of the church twice a year in Lebanon during the civil war that devastated the country between 1975 and 1990, amid the bombings and the artillery fire. He played an active role in their efforts to build peace. 1984, marked the beginning of foreigners being taken hostage in Beirut. Brother Andrew took the decision to organize a swap while listening to a friend describing the suffering of a hostage that he knew. My children had grown up, my affairs were in order, I was therefore available to take the hostage's place. I prayed a lot about it and made inquiries regarding the alleged hostage takers and I found out that the well-organized Hezbollah movement, whose spiritual leader was the Ayatollah Fadlala, so I asked to meet him. In April 2005, at the 50th anniversary of the Open Doors mission, Brother Andrew tells the story. I got in because, into the Hezbollah because I offered my life in exchange for a hostage. J'ai réussi à pénétrer le Hezbollah en offrant ma vie pour, en échange pour un otage, qui, un de leurs otages. Et ce chef de Hezbollah m'a dit, mais André, comment peux-tu faire une chose pareille you, you what you're Tu ne sais même pas ce que tu dis. I said, I do know what I'm mais je lui ai dit, non, écoute, moi je sais ce que this je is dis. What Jesus did for me. Parce que c'est exactement ce que Jésus and, a fait and pour he moi. Died on the cross, he gave his life so that I could go free. Et lui, il est... Mort sur la croix, il a donné sa vie pour que moi je sois libre. C'est l'évangile et c'est la seule manière que nous ayons de prouver que véritablement nous sommes les disciples de Jésus. Brother Andrew's attempt didn't pay off, but enabled him to be in touch with Sheikh Fadlala. I visit him almost every year. J'ai eu l'occasion de lui rendre visite pratiquement chaque année. We have become kind of friends. Et nous sommes devenus, disons, plus ou moins amis. And because of that, I can go into all the Hezbollah areas and distribute scriptures. Mais en tout cas, ça me permet de visiter tout le Hezbollah et y apporter les écritures. In a few weeks' time, I hope to be back with the Taliban. And everybody is scared stiff of Taliban, and I'm not, because they're my friends, I love them. And they asked me to come and preach about Jesus. They asked me for Bibles. They asked me to come back and tell them more about Jesus. And I said, no, here is a mission field, and we are acting as if this is our enemy. Then we're on the wrong way. 
this, this is not the way to win Muslims for Christ when we make war or when we send the NATO or the Americans or smart bombs or drones or uh, occupation armies. Then we perpetuate the enmity, the, the, the antagonism, the warlike situation. It can only be broken through if we go there with the love of Christ. So I've started, uh, I was not originally in that, by uh, spelling Islam as I sincerely love all Muslims. If we do, then there's no barrier. It was December 1992. Brother Andrew was preparing for a conference in Holland when a friend from the Lebanon phoned him to invite him to visit 415 Palestinian men who had been deported into the mountains in the south of Lebanon. These men, who had been wrenched from their homes and places of work in the West Bank and Gaza, were the intellectual leaders of Hamas, the radical Islamist group. They are struggling to survive in difficult conditions, he was told. Why don't you come with me and see what Christ can do for them? I had read the decrees of Hamas carefully. They state that jihad is the only solution to the Palestinian problem and their aim is to fly the banner of Allah over every square centimeter of Palestine. But I did think that in risking visiting these men, I could open a door to the church in Gaza, where Hamas already exercises such a huge influence. The church had to propose an alternative to violence and give them the chance to know what true Christianity is. In an interview given to the newspaper Alilu in January 2006, Brother Andrew said, We made contact and we became friends with them. We were received by the deputy leader of Hamas. At their request, I visited their families. We took them Bibles, we gave our testimony, prayed for them, and we took some photos of us together. So Brother Andrew shared various meals with some of the leaders of Hamas, one of them in Gaza in March 1994, where 400 men came together. On this occasion, he gave a conference in order to speak about his own meeting with Christ, followed by a lecture on what true Christianity is at the Islamic University of Gaza, one of the most fundamental Muslim institutions in the world. In December 1996, Brother Andrew spoke in front of representatives of Hamas, students and teaching staff. The whole world is in crisis. Fate has gathered us here. It's not just by chance that I am here at the university, because Islam and Christianity are the two main influences in the world today and will continue to have this influence. True Christianity teaches that we have to follow Jesus Christ. Jesus said that we must take up our cross every day and follow him. And pointing my finger towards the audience, I added, you Muslims will never understand the deep significance of the cross as long as we Christians don't take the words of Jesus seriously. There are some people who say, Andrew, you are wrong you are making yourself a friend to the enemies of Israel. I say to them, 
This is the best thing I can do for Israel, to bring its enemies to Christ. My mission is not to interfere with the political side of things, but to introduce Christ to people. Following his contacts with Hamas, Brother Andrew was invited to meet the founder of the group, Shak Ahmad Yassin. So in 1997, he gave him a Bible and one of his books in Arabic. Yassin was assassinated in March 2004. We uh, have many testimonies of uh, Muslims who become Christians. But generally, it is not accepted that you leave the world of Islam and become a Christian. Partly uh, because of their close alliance, almost like a covenant with the world of Islam, uh, it's not allowed, you cannot break away. They see. They see the world of Islam as a building and, and if anybody gets converted it means one brick is pulled out of the building and if you pull too many bricks out, and of course missionaries do that, <laughs> then the whole building will collapse, the Ummah will go down. And uh, so they are absolutely set, dead set against that. And when somehow you can uh, get through with the message of Jesus, then they get ostracized, they get thrown out of the family. That's the first duty. And literally, it is the duty of the father or a son to kill the person in your own family who has accepted Christ. This is a big problem. And I don't take this lightly uh, of the people in recent years that, for instance, I have baptized the Afghan people and a number ordained into the ministry to be pastors and evangelists I think about 12 have been killed now. and that that breaks my heart and of course then you're tempted to say well let me not do it at least then they don't get killed no but then they are lost what is worse How can a Muslim get to know Jesus Christ? Our infiltrating into their world is a slow, often painful, hard course to take. But I was not long ago with the leader of the Islamic Jihad, a very interesting man, and I told him that many Muslims in the world get a vision from Jesus or a dream. And I explained that. He had never heard of that. Of course, we in, in this work, we always hear about that. Because they even think that the majority of Muslims coming to Christ start with a dream or a vision. God's spirit is still at work. So I told him all that. And he was so eager to listen to me. And then I said, now I'm going to pray with you. So I went over. And he had his hand on, on, the, on the armchair, and I put my hand on his hand. He put his other hand over my hand. <laughs> and I prayed to Jesus. I said, Lord Jesus, will you give this man a vision of yourself? Let people become open to a longing, desire, let us as Christians pray for the Muslims. If we don't pray, how, how can we ever see, soon hope, a, a breakthrough of, of, of the gospel in, in their, um, I wouldn't say cruel, but their hard world. It's hard. And that's, I think, why we're up against what we call Muslim fundamentalists. They die. They blow themselves up 
to suicide bombers. And I think it's the most horrible thing you can do as a young person to put dynamite around your, your belly and blow yourself up and, and take some of the enemy with you. Why do they do it? Because they feel in their heart they have to make a sacrifice. And this, for the Muslims, the only way to go to paradise, to heaven, to die in the jihad. No Muslim has any assurance of salvation. Only when you die in the jihad. So then I tell them, don't do it, because somebody already died for you. We have a special responsibility for the Christians. The Christians, they were persecuted under communism. That was our focus in our mission. The Christians in the world of Islam are suffering more relatively. That is our main focus, to help them because they are the household of faith. But we realize that to solve their problem, we better reach those who cause the persecution. That Kyrie should be on our lips day and night for the people that we think of, the names that we remember. Uh, there must be hundreds of names that pass through our minds every day. Pray for them the moment a name occurs. And then somehow in the dark spot where they are, light brings through, breaks through. Comfort, help, uh, that's how God connects. Pray always and, and don't, well, this is a severe word of warning, let us as Christians not have a black list of people whom we do not want to see in heaven. That means if it's the big enemy, pray big for him. I pray every day for Bin Laden because I want him to get to know Jesus. And because I pray for him, he's not my enemy. And I hope, I hope one day to get through. If not, it's still okay. I pray for him. We must pray for the people instead of writing them off. God hasn't written anybody off. Give God the chance through your prayer life. <laughs> This month, we can pray for all the Christians who live in Muslim countries and also for each one of us so that we can give an account of the hope that is in us. The word of the month is in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 28, verses 18 to 20. Jesus came to his disciples and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age.